Okay, so we are gathered here today to talk about a paper story that came out in the journal Nature recently. Um, I would, uh, by the title, Origin and Elaboration of a Major Evolutionary Transition in Individuality. Uh, before I get into the, uh, the scientific part of the story, I would like to start by uh, thanking my co authors on this paper. Uh, the, this um, research started uh, quite some time ago, about six years ago, when I was uh, still working at McGill University in Canada with Professor Ihar Olai, shown here on the left. We were interested in understanding uh, development in the ants, and uh, we soon realized that development in these particular ants that we were interested in um, proceeds in the presence of a huge number of endocrine ants. And uh, one early experiment told us that uh, out of the DNA that is present in a freshly laid egg, uh, a huge majority, 97% of the DNA present, belongs to one endocrine ant, and 2.7% belongs to the ant, and the rest are either uh, ectopic endocrine ants or would have been something like that. So, presence of 97% of DNA from a different species means a lot. That means development must be thought about and development must be the, uh, the developmental program or the genetic mechanism for making an egg into a proper ant or an adult ant must have to go through uh, changes. Uh, so I can barely appear. Proceed in the presence of huge number of endosynthesis. The second thing we realized was that the endosynthesis was actually carried through the ovary of the ant mother and uh, is present already in the egg when it is made, which means that it must have something to do with the germline, which is the mechanism which forms the gonads, the ovaries of the mother. So the ovaries must be infected. A couple of years later, uh, a graduate student joined Ahab's lab, or Junie, goes by the name Juni. Juni was interested in germline development independently. And he had been studying germline development in ants. He had started studying germline development in ants. And when we looked at data from this particular group of species, we saw and uh, open questions, the link between endosymbion and the germline. So he joined in the, um, the group, and the three of us um, did conducted experiments for the next three years, and then we wrote the paper, uh, wrote, and then finally it was published this month. Um, why is it important? In order to understand why uh, we must try and understand development and why we must try and understand the interaction between the bacteria and, and, uh, and other organisms. I will show you in a few slides what does it mean for the greater uh, questions about life on this planet. Here is a phylogenetic tree, it's rather old now, but this is a phylogenetic tree. Phylogenetic tree is basically a relationship tree between different uh, organisms. Here, each branch represents a lineage in a particular family or a genus or a species. And that's here is the root of the tree of life. And on the bottom you see the timeline. This is today. And these are millions of years in the past. And here is about 400, 4,000, 400 million years ago. I think it's 4,000 million years old. So if you look at this tree, the beginning for a long period there is only bacteria, and then we see a huge number of what are called eukaryotes. Eukaryotes are a different form of life than bacteria. Bacteria do not have nucleus, for example. This is one difference. The bacteria do not have uh, certain organelles, these are sub-chambers inside the cell of an organism. 
So these subchambers are present only in nuclear cells, uh, which includes, for example, animals, plants, fungi, etc. So here's uh, some mass extinctions that are shown. Everybody of us is, is familiar with the extinction of dinosaurs. And again, that happened just gives you the context of the time scale here. It is 65 million years ago, dinosaurs were extinct. But if you take, uh, if you redraw this tree based on relative abundance, meaning how many different types of organisms are present on that group, in that group, you see a, a very different picture. All the abundant and diverse branches belong to bacteria. This big crown here, that's an all bacteria. And there we have a branch that connects to these group of prokaryotes called archaea. And within this branch, you have a small green branch. This contains all eukaryotes, meaning all animals, all plants, all fungi, and uh, algae, and whatever you can think of. Everything that you can basically see with your eyes belongs in this little branch. This means that bacteria are present everywhere. Some of these bacteria live freely uh, in water or in soil or uh, in, in organic matter, but a lot of these bacteria actually live inside other organisms. These are called symbionts. Some of these live inside cells of other organisms, and these are called endosymbionts. And uh, many years ago, this uh, scientist from the United States named Lynn Margulis, she proposed that the eukaryotic cell originated from the merger of uh, archaean cell and bacteria. An archaean cell was infected by bacteria, and these bacteria came to be symbionts inside the cell, and this is called as the endosymbiosis theory or the symbiogenesis theory. So this is basically at the origin of all eukaryotes, this event. But we didn't know, we don't know how this happened, what was the mechanism for this transition. And our story, as I may be able to convince you, is a step forward in understanding this mechanism. We know that endosymbionts are inside the cell. Because they are inside the cell, they must affect everything that is happening in the cell. They are not living as if two individuals interacting with each other, one producing something, the other receiving it, and producing something in response, but they are within the cell, meaning the cell physiology, the cell genetics, and for multicellular organisms, the development of the organism must happen somehow uh, in consonance or in a mutual acceptance between the bacteria and the, these uh, higher organisms. Here are some of the examples that I have always been showing. This is a spotted salamander. It has algae on its skin surface. These algae produce uh, sugars through photosynthesis. They are green algae. If the salamander sits in the sun, it produces sugars through its skin and absorbs the sugar and uses it for its energy. This is one example. Here is another example of a squid where the squid has an organ at the base of its body which produces blue light. This blue light is produced by the bacteria, actually. The squid has no mechanism for producing this light. Bacteria produce this light. But when the squid is swimming in the sea under moonlight, this light makes the squid invisible to predators from below. It's kind of an invisibility because it's producing a light that mimics moonlight. And there is another example from a, a fly where bacteria, Wolbachia, the presence or absence of the organism, uh, this particular bacterium inside the 
inside the flies makes them sterile under certain con under certain conditions, so that there is a strict uh, mechanism of reproduction selected in one particular lineage. All right. So why is development important for this question? Development is important because, as I said earlier, obligate endosymbionts, those endosymbionts on which the host depends necessarily, will not survive without them, this is called, they are called obligate endosymbionts. And may, most of them are transmitted maternally, maternally meaning the mother already provisions the child with these endosymbionts. There are different mechanisms through which the mother can provision the child with these endosymbionts. Sometimes they are present on the surface of the egg, for example, in chickens. Sometimes they are present inside cells that are present in the ovary, and these are transmitted to the egg. So that means, because they are present, they are maternal, they must be present throughout the life cycle, because this has to now be carried through the life cycle of the individual until it goes to the next generation. So the entire life cycle has to have presence of this endosymbiont. Yeah? And then that means that the entire developmental program, because the developmental program, the current definition of it is not uh, embryology, which is sometimes confused with development. Development basically includes the entire life cycle, changes in the entire life cycle of an individual from its beginning all the way until its death. That's basically the way. So uh, now, this aspect of uh, endosymbiosis has remained unexplored for, the, for many reasons. But one of the key reasons was that people always thought of endosymbiosis from the frame of symbiosis. They thought of symbiosis, which is mutual benefit. And here there are two individual actors, the host and the symbiont, or one symbiont with another symbiont. They are interacting through give and take. And often what happens in such give and take is that some of the functions of one of the organisms are lost. And complementary functions of that are lost in its partner. So that their uh, union is kind of, it's an entrapment of loss. They lose something, each of them loses something and get trapped in this mutual union. So people saw development as, a, it was treated as a black box. It was treated as if, uh, well, the interaction happens at the adult level, basically. So here is uh, an animation I took just for the, because of a broad audience. We are looking here at how genes, here these uh, little uh, figures there are representing different genes. The arrows are representing activations. This circuit method of showing, um, showing uh, gene circuits goes back to uh, a certain Davidson who used to, who thought of uh, showing these arrows because genes interacting with each other can be thought of as um, one gene making the other either upregulated or turned down or turned up. And turn up is represented by an arrow, turn down is represented by this stuff or a dead end. So the names of the genes are not important. What is shown here is basically a schematic of how different genes interact with each other. So I'm going to play this again now. So you see how a particular gene takes multiple inputs, and in development, if this is an egg starting, you can have multiple genes turning on in multiple places in the body, and that can result in the end in different shapes or different phenotypes, okay? And in particular, this one is what I'm interested in because this is the development of the embryo in an insect, in, a tip, in an insect typically, where there are maternal factors, meaning things that the mother has provisioned. They turn on zygotic factors, which is genes that are turned on from the genome of the child, and then these interact with each other, ultimately you get this, the colors here represent different gene activity. 
so that even gene activity is now going to give rise to different um, tissues and organs, etc. Now, a little bit about ants. This is some ants. I show this slide in order to, um, for people to realize that ants is, ant is not your regular sidewalk ant that you always see the black one or the red one. And you want to ask, oh, it is the red ant, or it is the black ant, or it is the big black ant. Ants are actually immensely diverse uh, in shapes, in uh, sizes, in uh, you know, in different adaptations. For example, uh, you know, the presence of things that make them hide in their environment. Presence of overall, there are uh, about nine or these many um, subfamilies of ants. All ants are grouped in one family. There are subfamilies, and each of these subfamilies have characteristics that. I don't need to go into, but I just want to say that the ants themselves provide a, a, a great opportunity to understand history of organisms because of their diversity. And the ants, within the ants, there are three groups that actually have endosynia, that have cellular endosynia, and one of them, the most abundant one, the one that is most rich in terms of diversity, the number of species, etc., is this what's called the oh, oh, directly translated into Turkish as well as carpenter? What does the carpenter have? How? It has a, a block mania and endosynia inside its gut. But this is not in the gut as in our in human gut. It's present in the lining cells that line the gut. Inside those cells, and it produces nutrition and. What does the ant give it? The ant ensures because it's present. Yeah, it's yeah, most of the 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 and this is a stage, an intermediate stage, and this is a stage very close to becoming a larva, the next step in development, where you have these segments form. Before these segments form, there is a stage where there are, it's just a bag of cells or a sheet of cells. Well, um, this sheet of cells is called blastoderm. In the human equivalent, this would be the blastula stage. So, um, these colors here represent something. The uh, turquoise is the embryo. This is what will be become the larva. The yellow is what will become the ovary of the adult. This is uh, actually marked by a gene that is specifically expressed in the ovary. So that's a precursor of the ovary. And the red is extra embryonic, similar to amnion in, in your case. But if you take a look at an ant that has endosynia, this is an ant that has endosynia, same three stages. You see the first stage, a very interesting area, and this white mass of DNA present here is actually DNA belonging to the endosynia. These are endosynia that in the procedure. And then at the similar stage where you have a sack of cells, you have not these three, but you have two additional regions. You have the region that was yellow here, not yellow anymore, and it contains bacteria. This I have shown here in white. And the ovaries actually come from a different region, this region, which is shown here in yellow. And one more very striking thing is that the embryo, which used to be somewhere there, gets, has been pushed to the other side of the egg. Okay, so it, this is just comparative. We are comparing two different species. In the end, when you have the larva, pre larva, you have two additional features in this. You have this green sac, which contains the gonad or the ovary precursor, and everything else looks pretty much normal. Right? So the green sac and these cells, this seems to be new. Here, the cells are. Uh, placed on the on the embryo itself. Okay. 
Now, if you look at the genetics, then I will give some examples of the genes that regulate the formation of the donor formation of the ovary. And the, I said earlier that this is a gene that is specifically present only in the ovary precursor. When you look at a general and it's present in one spot, this yellow spot, that's where the future ovary will form. This is the region of cytoplasm that will give rise to the future ovary. And if you look at the species that we're looking at, and remember this white stuff is all bacteria, this yellow stuff appears to have found new places to be localized, new places to be uh, present. And this shows that after the infection of the bacteria, something has changed. The genes that regulate ovary development are no longer present only in one place. They are present in multiple places. What could they be doing there? So the question, next question you want to ask is, if these genes are present in other places, are they all making ovaries? Does this ant have five places where ovaries form? And uh, turns out, we took a look. This is again here for for uh, exam for comparison. This is a very basal ant with an embryo here, showing that this is staining for nuclei, staining for DNA. Here is the embryo. Pink shows where the embryo is, and there is a the Z's here that I show. They are uh, we call them the zones, the zones of presence of these genes, the yellow that I've shown here. So here is one zone, and there is the presence of, presence of the ovary precursor. And in this embryo, we have the embryo here. It's shifted to the anterior. That's going to, in the ancestral state, or in the normal ant, so to speak, we don't have another word for it, this uh, yellow part, these genes, are going to do two things. They are going to make the ovaries, but they are also going to make the tail of the larva and also the tail of the adult. Meaning that if you lose these genes, the tail of the adult is missing. The adult is formed without a tail. And we have seen examples of this. But the tail end in this end is somewhere else. It's not there. It's here. So that solves this question. So this yellow is actually making the tail end, probably. This yellow actually makes the ovaries. Only this one makes the ovaries. We tested this. This one is actually now changed its function. Instead of making an ovary, it now houses the bacteria. Remember, there were all these bacteria present in the host. So here they are shown in this blue, bright blue. They get all housed in cells, and this gene expression seems to be necessary for that. I'll show you in a minute how we infer that. And we also show that this expression here, which is present initially in the yolk, in the anterior, it's used for transporting the bacteria to the yolk, because eventually these bacteria inside cells, they have to be packaged, taken to the yolk, where the yolk eventually shrinks and forms the makeup. Okay, so that's how the trajectory, development and trajectory of these cells. We looked at a bunch of genes. Here is a number of genes that we have looked at. We are looking at two different stages, stage one, Stage six. stage 6 is the sac stage that I showed you. Stage 1 is basically the egg as it is laid by the mother. And these are different zones in which we see these gene activity. But if you look at every gene has a different signature in each of these zones from stage 1 to stage 6. I have highlighted here in brown those zones, those gene expressions that change from one stage to the other. That means this expression is not static. It's not that when it's in that zone, it's already, it's going to be there. No, it can be off and then turn on. Okay, it can be off here, but it turns on later in zone two. And it can be on and it can turn off later. Meaning that there is a, a dynamic change in gene expressions in these zones. But what does this do? What, does, what this does is it makes each of these zones, which all thought of, we thought would make ovaries, each of them is now unique from the point of view of genetic signature. All of them have a unique genetic signature, and that's probably how they manage to make different things. The tail of the embryo, the ovary, 
the cells for the bacteria and the guide for bacteria to go to the nuclei. Now, we wanted to know, does the bacteria, do the bacteria have anything to do with all these, uh, these changes? So what we did is we took a ant colony, we treated them with the recompensing antibiotic for many months, and then we looked at their embryos. When we looked at the embryos and we looked at the, these genes, we saw that the, the genes, so this embryo has been treated with recompensing. This is from a colony treated with recompensing. This is a, from a colony that is not treated with recompensing. And you see these, this particular gene is present only in two spots, or this one and this one. And when you treat them with antibiotic, these regions get changed. So there is loss of gene expression. All right? So basically, the thing that would make the ovary is now lost because we removed the Anderson one. All right? Which, is, which means that they might actually not be able to make ovaries, right? But strangely, strangely, when you let them develop, 33% of them actually make ovaries from this spot, which was going to not make ovaries, but was going to make bacteria, cells for bacteria. So that means that the organism retains this ability in that location, except that under normal condition, with the presence of bacteria, it doesn't use this for making ovaries, but it uses this to make something else. And when you take an egg from this colony that doesn't have this gene expression, but you reintroduce bacteria from a healthy egg or non-treated egg, you get restoration of this gene expression, meaning that it's dynamically dependent on bacteria. That means the bacteria are actually controlling exactly in real time. Because I have injected this embryo um, Exact uh, a few hours after it was laid, and we are looking at here uh, two days later. Two days later, the expression is back already, and it could even be less than we don't know. So, what does that mean? That means that the germline that was present in the ancestor or in the, in the ants in general has been co opted. We use this word uh, co option because. It's a standard way of saying that it was used for something else, and now it's used for something else. Right? Because it's now used for making these cells for bacteria, while there is a new location invented that is actually dependent on the activity of bacteria. This was one gene, and here I've shown an example of another type of gene, a Hox gene. These are uh, a different set of genes. Initially, I was talking about only germline. Uh, genes related to germline, but as I showed you, a list of genes we analyzed. Uh, we also analyzed the Hox genes because previously people had shown that Hox genes have something to do with these cells that bacteria are housing. But when we looked at these genes as well, they are also expressed in a similar fashion, meaning they are present. Firstly, they are present in uh, the egg as it is freshly laid here, for example. This is a freshly laid egg, and there is Hox genes present. I didn't show you that data, but there is uh, overwhelming evidence that this is the only case where they are present in the fresh data. They are normally present much later. I will show you later what that means. We, uh, these genes are not present matter uh, from the mother. They are not provisioned by the mother, but in this case, they are provisioned by the mother. And when you treat the colonies with antibiotics, these expressions are lost. Most of them are lost. Some are not lost. Okay. So we'll come to that in conclusion. How how does that uh, matter? Like I showed earlier, the the expression of these genes is dynamic changes from one stage to the other stage. But when you treat them with recompensing, the areas highlighted here in gray these are all the losses of gene expression. So each of these genes is lost in multiple locations. Although it's not lost, it's not a blanket loss, not all of these zones are eliminated, meaning that the bacteria are selectively choosing to turn them on uh, in some locations. And when you remove the bacteria, they are not turned on in those locations. That means there is an active control again. I'm repeating myself. 
And again, if you lose these, the activity, now if you do a technique that we do in the lab to turn off gene activity, here we have used RNAi to turn off the activity of these hot strings, and this is, I'm showing an example, there is a wild type embryo, I showed you this earlier, different zones that are giving rise to different uh, functional activity. When you uh, knock down this gene abdominally, you see that the gonad is severely reduced. This one is also almost gone. And the tail end is also kind of mangled up. Okay, so the expression is very different from the wild type. All right. Also, the embryo here is almost invisible. It's not. You can see the embryo at this stage if you have an embryologist's eye, you will be able to see that. But here it's almost invisible. So the loss of Hox genes also affects these. That means not only is the loss of bacteria, is the presence of bacteria important for making these zones, the presence of these genes is also important for making these zones, these new zones. Now, if you look at the late stages of these embryos that have been injected by RNA, by that have where the gene activity has been turned out. Here is a negative control. This is how a pig larva should look like. These are these blue, these are different segments of the body of the larva. And that is uh, one stage, and this is a slightly later stage. This is about 12th day, and this is about 15th day of every So that's how it should look like. Instead, when you lose one of these hot genes, the tail end, <laughs> the tail end is missing. First of all, again, the more of the tail end is lost. This is going only up to the thoracic segment. This means that thorax is present, abdomen is completely gone. Here there's a little bit of abdomen, but the rest is gone. Similarly, at the later stage, you see the, what would be gonad is actually not properly developed. There are scattered cells in here. They don't form the gonad properly. And in this case, it's in the egg somewhere else, it's lost. Bacteriocytes, these are white cells, these will, would normally go to the mid gut. In this case, they don't go to the mid gut, they get completely lost. In fact, when I fix these embryos, I wash them, the bacteria probably get washed away. So you can't see any white here. In this case, you see the bacteria here, they are lost. Because the activity that would guide them to the mid gut is gone, and the mid gut is not full. When you, if you do this uh, knockdown of these genes and you look at the expression of all the other genes that I showed you earlier, they are generally downgraded. And here I'm showing different zones separately. We took, we did an experiment where we took these zone, we took this embryo, injected them, and while they look normal externally, we took the tissues separately. We separated the tissue and did qPCRs. So these tissues are all of them are generally showing a down regulation of these genes and uh, if you look it's here uh, after knockdown okay here uh, for comparison we have these black bars that those represent if you inject a mock uh, yfp double standard rna then you do not see any down regulation and the down regulation after the actual experiment is significantly different from the y Right. So what this means is that on the left you're seeing general activity of these genes, Hox genes. Generally what they do is they define different parts of the body of an insect. So here different colors represent different Hox genes. They are present in the uh, in, uh, in a specific location in the insect. In case of Drosophila, this location is split in two, but in other insects this is one location. And they are expressed in different parts of the body. They give identity to different parts of the body. So if you have a mislocalization of this gene, for example, Antimophilia, if it's expressed here, you will have a fly that has legs sticking out of its head. The antenna turns into legs. So it is an identity gene. But in case of our ants, they don't do any such thing. So far, we are unable to see that kind of activity. Instead, what we see is they are they have been pushed in this hierarchy of genes way ahead. They are maternally provident and they set off 
formation of the donut and set of formation of the tail of the embryo. And then there are the other two functions that I mentioned earlier, those are specific to endosynthesis. This means a uh, rewiring, that means that the developmental program has been rewired or this network has been changed so that something that was supposed to be turned on here in specific segments is now turned on there. And this turning on, strangely, is dependent on the bacteria. That is the strangest part and the novel part. Because it's okay that hox genes can be provagent in maternity. Other hox genes have been shown to be provagent in maternity. But in this case, they are dependent on bacteria part of them, and then they are also functioning to regulate the formation of these different structures that are needed for endosynthesis. Now, if you, this is where Judy's, most of Judy's work comes, and uh, most of Ahab's work comes along, because they did, uh, a, they scanned the phylogenetic tree, the relatives of these ants. They looked at a number of relatives until we finally reached about 71 different species. Here on the right, these are names of different species that we have looked at. This includes three subfamilies. Mostly the subfamily that we are interested in, where these carpet ants are. And we start by the question what we see in this carpet ant, does it happen anywhere else? Or is it only a special case? All right? So we know, I showed you, that in the ancestral state, in the normal ant, the sidewalk ant, you have a situation where there is an embryo and then there is a little yellow spot that I showed you, which will do two things. It will make the donut and it will make the tail of the embryo. And we see similar condition in a bunch of species here. There is a, there is a couple of uh, exceptions I want to go there, it will be a bit confusing, but for the sake of simplicity, this is the condition that is present in these lineages. Now in this, in this spot, we see, and this is a technique we do, what we do is we figure out the condition first in all these species, all right? So we see, we take a look at the gene expression in these species at the embryonic level, and then we score, yes, it has uh, presence of embryo here, and it has presence of this gene in the posterior. Then we take a look at this other species, and we say, okay, it has the presence of the embryo in the anterior, and it has the presence of the gene in two places, or three places, or one place. Then we give these different scores and we run a computational analysis on predicting what would the ancestor have looked like here. Because we don't know this ancestor is, has been dead for 80 million years. But we can predict, or we can, I don't know what the word is, ask if you know that here, for what we can call it, because this is talking about the past. Uh, we can compute the probability of the uh, condition in this ancestor. And we see that this ancestor around here actually has a, another additional location where the gene is expressed, must have had. So we have, we are going from one location to two locations, okay? And that we call a pre-existing capacity. So there is a pre-existing, because here, remember, the endosymbiosis is not present in many of these. It's present in these, and some of these also, although those are different organisms, those are not the same organisms that we are studying. And uh, at the origin of endosymbiosis, this is the green, I'm representing the coming of the bacteria, the big flash. The bacteria enter, and you have three different locations where they are present this gene activity. And again, it's combinatorial. It's not that all three of them have every other gene, but there are three locations at, at where uh, at least one of the genes is always present. And that tells you that at the origin, there was already a pre-adaptation present, and that pre-adaptation was used because there is something here, but it's at the head of the embryo. This is where the embryo will have its head, this is where the tail will be. At the head part of the embryo, 
there is activity of genes that normally make the ovary. All right? So that's kind of it. Now, it's there. We don't know yet what it is doing there, but in the ancestor, it has been there. But as soon as the bacteria come in, for convenience or for the sake of uh, uh, coming out of this struggle, or trying to, to strike a balance between the presence of the bacteria, the embryo makes its tail instead in this new location. It gives up its position for the tail and makes the tail in a new location. Further, in some species within this group, we see an additional fourth place where they are dispersed, which gives rise to a new gonad. And a, a new, a novel structure of uh, a tissue that surrounds the gonad. So, sort of, uh, the uh, embryo invents an uh, additional sac to protect its ovaries. This is not present in these. Okay. And uh, what this means is that we have figured out stepwise, step one, where there is a pre existing capacity, step two, where this pre existing capacity is utilized to move the embryo to a different location, and step three, where an additional germline is now created. Now, we always thought, why do you need this fourth step? Because there's already, you already got rid of this function of making the tail, because the, in traditionally, in uh, many, many organisms, the function of making the tail and, and making the gonad is linked. It's the same pathway that does these two things. So these guys have actually managed to split these two functions, to divide these two functions. And we realize that the difference between these two, the last one, the last one comes as a very big surprise because it has very low uh, um, presence of bacteria. It has bacteria, but they're not many. So it appears as if the presence of bacteria in the posterior as if the presence of bacteria in the posterior has prompted the organism to divide their population in two. One population that is used to be, that goes along with the ovary to the next generation, and another population which is much bigger, which goes to the middle. And here is some of the, the way it has been received in the wider community. I want to share a few of them with you. Um, people have been saying that it is one of the discoveries of the year in biological sciences, okay? And then it is, uh, some people say brilliant work, some people say um, impressive, some people say jaw-dropping, some people say coolest paper this week. But what, ca what caught my eye the most was this tweet by a well-known scientist, Stuart Newman, who said that it's a fantastic contribution to evolutionary development of biology. Really unexpected, Lynn Margulis would be would have been thrilled. She passed away uh, a few years ago. She was the person who proposed this uh, symbiogenesis theory, and today she would be proud that actually someone, in fact, showed the mechanism through which this can happen. Here's a representation of the step that she had proposed on one of her with that, I would like to thank the people who have supported this work, most importantly the ants, and then the Canadian funding agencies in Bismarck, Bismarck University of all for uh, about three years of support, my former uh, McGill University, and I will take questions. There are questions online. And if, yes. I, I guess we talked about this, but uh, if you didn't use uh, Huntington, did you use some other answer? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, this is a question that I get in different shapes in many places where I present is because uh, we have, we tried other antibiotics, but the um, 
heresy and derivatives do not work uh, on blockmania because uh, blockmania remain quiescent. They do not divide during embryonic, during embryogenesis or even larval development. They do not divide because they don't divide. Penicillin and derivatives cannot do anything. Rifampicin itself um, uh, works directly by attacking the uh, protein synthesis mechanism, the ribosome, and therefore it's very effective. If I would use the other similar antibiotics, they would work. Um, we did control experiments because there was suspicion that maybe all these rarities that we are seeing are not only because of the loss of these bacteria, but they're also because of uh, mitochondrial toxicity, because the enhancing can also affect mitochondria. We did um, several control experiments, and one of the control experiments that actually worked the best was when you treat them with glyphosate, the and then you re-inject the block mania, you get a restoration of the phenotype. Meaning that the phenotype was exactly because of the absence of these bacteria. If it would have been a genetic defect of the mitochondria, you would not see the restoration. Yes, Rafael. Did you try to uh, <coughs> re-inoculate after rifampicin treatment? Did you try to re-inoculate another species of bacteria that closely related and see if this other species would do the same? Yes, so this is a good question also. Unfortunately, this experiment is a little bit difficult to do. And the reason for this is that Lachmania is a unique lineage that co-evolves uh, co with the host. So all Lachmania are present in the, these ants. Okay? The nearest relatives are also uh, present in other organisms as cellular and symbionts. They cannot be cultured. They cannot be cultured in the laboratory. They are all candidates. They cannot be. They have been identified through gene, uh, through DNA, uh, uh, DNA sequencing, etc. They cannot be kept in the lab. So the experiment is difficult. Although at this moment we are trying to go in that direction to in, to inject to do these experiments. We will hopefully do it in the future. Yes. Yes, I do. We have, um, I did not present it here because I wanted this to be a really um, thing that is more understandable for a general audience. However, um, this is a very strange uh, phenomenon. The ants normally do not have these endosymbionts, but this one group that has these endosymbionts. The nearest relatives come from endosymbionts of um, Sika, Sikara group. Sikara is, a, I don't know what you guys call it in Turkish, but it's one of those uh, big uh, insects that makes a lot of noise, comes every certain years. It has also smaller relatives. These smaller relatives, together in that family, Sikara, they uh, are in a group called True Bugs, and we're interested in that for many reasons. One reason is that it's the same uh, order of insects where the blockmania originated from. One. So we want to know, uh, we have had this hypothesis for a long time, which is that perhaps uh, mitochondria evolved through something like uh, learning from one host and infecting a secondary host by having learned the genetic pathways in one host, in a previous host. So this goes like that. We think that maybe in the uh, in the bug or in the cicadales or in whatever hemat these are called hemat bugs, maybe they were already familiar with these genes. Okay, so that as soon as they were jump to infect another group, they their familiarity led to certain genetic circuitry changes that became conducive to them. That's one. For this very reason, we are actually really sick of in the lab right now, and we're trying to do antibiotic treatments on them. And we know from uh, work that has been done in the 70s that within sick of if you uh, lose the anti uh, lose the through antibiotics, 
we have a very simple genotype to what we see, which means the deletion of the tail end of the embryo. We have partly replicated this uh, experiment that was done in the 70s, and we hope to. Uh, we are doing a, a project where we uh, want to show the genetic differences between these truncated embryos in the sick cells and normal embryos. That will tell us what are the genetic circuits affected by the lose, loss of this. So, this is a very brilliant area in the future to look at the. Yes, okay. Yes, but this is like the cells that uh, curve that complete their cycle sometimes a year. How are you going to uh, to do this? I mean, some cells even seven years, right? Yes, they all. They there is a the big cicadas. They appear uh, for mating every prime number of years. It's a very interesting fun fact. But uh, not all cicadas are like that. The small cicadas. Uh, they are they are just the life cycle is about uh, two months. So after two months, you can have reproductive, you can have eggs, and they will grow on to become adults. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Two questions. Uh, first one, I'm sure the panel did it. Uh, and uh, so there was one part of pre existing capacity. What do you think could have been the trigger for that? Um, so something happened a long time ago. So uh, I guess the stage was set, but what could have set it which um, It was quite stark and different from the original. The second question um, so this I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's an article in this article that says the bacteria has the last laugh. Uh, <laughs> yes. could, you, could you elaborate on who is really having the edge in mean, this? Um, yes, this is also a very good question. I'm coming to the first question first. The first question is about whether the pre uh, pre adaptation could have had a trigger. There are uh, two alternative hypotheses to this. One is that there might have been another species of bacteria that infected this ancestor, but because the descendants, many of the descendants do not have anosinias, our reconstruction doesn't tell us whether that, that is highly, it shows it as a low probability scenario that there was another anosinia. So that would mean that an anosinia already triggered this first change, but was lost. And another anosinia hopped on and used this that was initially there. Other than that, if the endosymbiont, which is our prediction that the endosymbiont was not present in this ancestor from the ancestor state reconstruction, we infer that it was not present. We don't know exactly what we could have triggered this. Now, there is a hint, which is that uh, the, the way the mechanism, the physical mechanism, or the molecular mechanism through which these different zones are created in the first place in the mother is through a transport machine. Maternal uh, deposits or the, the mother provisions the egg with messenger RNAs and proteins and fat globules, etc. But they are not placed in a sack randomly because the egg has to pattern into something. They are placed in a very specific manner. Some of them are only present in the posterior pole, some of them are only present in the anterior pole, some of them are only in the middle, some of them are in, as a ring, all right? Because this is in anticipation of what will form in the egg in those locations. The mother already has a mechanism of transport. This mechanism of transport is microtubule dependent, dynamic dependent. We know some of the components that are used for this mechanism. And we suspect that the, the mechanism of transport changes. So mechanistically speaking, we don't know what the trigger is still, but this is where we will be able to identify the trigger because we are trying to figure out this mechanism, whether it has changed in these organisms and how it has changed. So in the future, we may be able to pinpoint the trigger. But first, we need to understand 
how it changed the machinery, the transport machinery. Second question, is it worth it for the organism? That's a philosophical question, actually. Uh, the, uh, uh, the net outcome of this for the amps, you can see, is brilliant. Because these are the hyperdiverse group of amps globally. One. Second, they are much larger than other ants, these group of ants. So this enhanced nutrition actually does them some good. They benefit greatly. Third, if you look at other uh, lineages of bacteria, if you think about it, they are not as successful. If, the, if something untoward happens, the more diverse the ants, the more likely they will survive. So if there is an event like that which eliminated the dinosaurs, if such an event occurs that eliminates carbon grants, let's say, the chances of some of these species of carbon grants surviving is higher. And therefore, the chances that these bacteria will survive is higher. So as a net result, they are increasing their probability of surviving in the long run, definitely. So it is worth it. Yes. Yes. Uh, good question. I we have the entire uh, genome set of the early embryo, and I believe there is P one seven four presence. I have seen fragments of P one seven four virus, so those those must be coming from the presence there. So they could have come from either the bacteria or they could have come from uh, sequences that are resembling P174 but that are present in the ant host itself. We cannot distinguish that as yet, but we can do experiments to distinguish between them. Plasmids is another story. I don't think of any report of Lachmania containing plasmids. Does that answer your question? No. No? Is there any question online? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, this is quite a high level scientific uh, study for me. Uh, but uh, you have mentioned about one of my colleagues. You have told about uh, carpenter ant. I have also yeah. body camp carpenter. <laughs> uh, my question is that uh, what's, your, um, what's your aim for the future? It's like a first step of like a stairs of this study. What's your, what's your last step for your studies for the future? I have lots of steps ahead, but not any last step. There is no last step. It's an infinite journey. That is just answering the last part of the question. But we have many projects going on. Like I mentioned at the moment, we are trying to understand the differences between within the true bugs, within the hemipteran bugs or the cicadales, and within other ant species, uh, whether this mechanism is uh, so this is the start of uh, a new way of thinking about endosynthesis. Endosynthesis, like I said in the beginning, people have been thinking of it as a one-on-one -on -one interaction. Now a new field has been invented in which people are now uh, thinking of the endosymbiont in the context of the cell. So therefore, now it's open for every other organism, including vertebrates, higher vertebrates, including humans. And there have been reports that they could also be occupying cells in the, in the human uh, intestines that we previously would characterize as infections. 
but we don't know nobody has really in-depth studies. So all organisms are now open to investigation to test this hypothesis that endosomials might be present inside cells in a wide range of animals. They are, it's known in lower animals, it's known in, known in bugs and other things, but for high vertebrates it's not so much. So we will gradually try to investigate some of those questions. Uh, more importantly, I want to also test this big question. Does presence of endosomiont in one host preempt the possibility of it uh, being happy in another host? And maybe that would have would explain why the events, initial events of symbiogenesis are so abundant and are made life so much more successful in that particular unit, like formation of mitochondria, formation of chloroplast, plastics, etc. All those questions can now be addressed from a different angle, provided we get the support from the department in the European Commission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, go ahead. Yes, so, right, uh, yeah, that's actually something that has been uh, fascinating me for a long time. We only, the way we know that mitochondrial uh, uh, endosymbiosis theory proposes that this is a singular event, an event of an archaea getting infected by uh, mitochondria. But what my uh, research has shown, which um, added another possibility, which is that initially the mitochondrion or this total mitochondria infected an archaic cell and became uh, accustomed to these cells, but this event must have been not a permanent uh, event where it would be coming and going, kind of like some get infected, lose the infection, and get reinfected, lose the infection, much like what COVID is doing now. But, uh, because of this familiarity with the cellular term, uh, environment, now these total mitochondria have the ability to infect other cells that have never seen an infection before. So that now this event spreads, sort of, in the archaic, right, in, partic in a particular branch. This, I think, is an alternative hypothesis that never has never been thought of before. This is probably the first time I am actually uh, proposing it, thinking about it, it's something we will try to test. Uh, Occam's razor, of course, we always stumble on the shortest path first, because we are reductionists by nature, science is reductionist, we cannot, it would be nice if we can do a um, very complex, although, to just to mention that this paper, even by people in the field, uh, some one person within the field uh, mentioned in a tweet that this actually was a very complex paper. Meaning that even people within the field find it complex, the intricate time together of the thread. So we found a mechanism that was not immediately obvious in this paper, actually. In the beginning, we thought. Well, the oxygen has changed its function. And then we thought, okay, maybe the bacteria are there, but does it have anything to do with the oxygen? Then we thought, oh yeah, the oxygen are probably doing something with the bacteria. So it actually 
piece together really slowly, and there's something like a lesson for us who are, anti who are anticipating to publish high quality science that sometimes the story takes a long time to take its final shape, and uh, the more harder you work on it and hit it at the right places, it actually uh, yields more, not necessarily the shortest answer. All right, I think that is it. Thank you very much for your patience.